the cornfield, just an area for producing food, or a land full of secrets? Why are some cornfield inhabitants harmful and others useful? What do the colourful flowers at the edge of the field promise us? In winter, the cornfield looks like a strange extraterrestrial landscape. In the Western industrial nations, cornfields and woods take up the greatest proportion of rural land. But how much natural life dwells in what now seems like a desert? The hare was originally a steppe animal, but he also feels at home on a bare field. It's mating time now in the early spring. The bucks race at speeds of 70 kilometers per hour in an attempt to impress and win over a doe. About one metre deep in the ground, a hamster doe is dozing in her burrow. She's hibernated throughout the time in which the untilled cornfield resembled a desert. Above, the first arrivals, such as common toads and golden ground beetles, are appearing on the still bare field. For many animals, a field is a kind of no-man's land, just waiting to be conquered. The days are growing longer, and the slows along the edge of the field take on a white veil just like the old cherry tree at the other side of the field. Close by, the hamster doe is busy removing the hardened clod of earth she used last autumn to seal off the inside of her burrow. The winter reserves are almost used up. It's time for her to make her way up to the surface. It's still almost impossible for the hamster doe to find anything edible on the bare, clodded earth. It's a tough time for her. When the cherry tree is in full bloom, the field horsetails shoot up out of the soil. The cone-shaped tips of the shoots bear ripening spores, which will later be carried away by the wind. After this unsuccessful trip to the surface, the hamster doe returns to her fortress. There are turbulent times ahead of her. Within a few hours, the appearance of the hamster's habitat has changed.
During the sowing, 300 grain seeds were dropped into each square meter of soil. Just 14 days later, an army of seedlings shoot upwards. Within a few days, the bald field has turned into a green field. All types of grain are a kind of grass. This means that the cornfield is actually a grassland, and therefore a steppe formed by humans. The old cherry tree is standing in an ocean of seedlings, with an increasing number of animals romping between them. It's now worthwhile for the hamster doe to leave the safe burrow. While the quail parents are busy with a dust bath, the hungry hamster doe sniffs an opportunity. Such calorie bombs are just what she needs because she has to build herself up for the exhausting time ahead of mating and rearing her young. the hares, the pheasants are also turning their attention now to searching for a mate. The red swollen wattles on their faces and their excited fluttering are expected to work wonders. A hamster buck is on his way in the field and has picked up the scent of the hamster doe down in her burrow. Hamsters are actually solitary animals and tend to be aggressive to each other. However, they now approach each other cautiously and accept each other straight away. The hamsters mate dozens of times to make sure they really will produce offspring. Exhausted, they both fall asleep. Hamsters tolerate this togetherness for only a few days a year. Within just a few weeks, field crops have developed out of the tiny seedlings. While the grain is growing, the pests thrive too. These include the grain aphid, which rank among a farmer's main enemies because they can spread out as if from an explosion and infest entire fields. However, the farmers do have an ally in the fight against the army of sap-sucking insects. A single ladybird can exterminate up to 40,000 aphids in his lifetime. Where such beneficial organisms are allowed to increase without interference, there is no need for the chemical cudgel. The Germanic tribes of old revered the useful ladybird. At that time, it was not yet dedicated to Our Lady, the Mother of God, but called the Little Friar Bird, after the highest Germanic goddess. No small bird, but an imposing bird of prey is the Montague's Harrier. On a dirt track, the male Harrier woos a female. 
In the end, the object of his desire succumbs high in the air, when in the middle of a skillful flight maneuver, he presents a field mouse to her as a wedding gift. Nowadays, we have very few large meadow areas that are left unmown until the summer. For that reason, the Montague's Harriers breed in cornfields now. The larger the field, the better. Predators have little chance of finding their nests here. The landscape around the old cherry tree has donned its summer dress. As far as the eye can see, there are cornfields at different stages of ripeness. Where no weed killers are used, the fields present themselves not just in a simple shade of green, but with a host of colorful flowers. Night flowering catchfly, common mallow, Johnny jump, pimpernel, cornflower, Venus's looking glass, corn cockle. They've all adapted to a life in the sea of grass formed by human hands. The most well-known flower in the field is perhaps the red poppy, a flower that holds plenty of promise. Only when this bright red flower is blooming on field balks can a creature exist which at first will change the appearance of the poppy blossoms completely. This visitor is an extremely rare insect, the poppy mason bee. She searches for particular poppy blossoms and cuts fingernail sized pieces out of them. Back in her brood cell, she unrolls the small ball of petals and works them into the wall lining. And so a nursery in red velvet emerges. Other animals are interested in poppy flowers too. The field hamsters consider the red blossoms a delicacy. The hamster doe enjoys the first one she picks straight away. And then stuffs some more poppy blossoms into her cheek pouches. On each side of their mouths, the hamsters have a cheek pouch, which serves as a carrier bag when they search for food in the forest of storks through which the short-sighted rodents find their way by relying on their sense of smell. The poppy mason bee does hard labour. The stone that fell into the brood cell is three times as heavy as she is herself. The lump of rock has to be taken out so that she can bring flower pollen, which the larvae will eat later. Finally, the bee removes the dried up pieces of poppy, which have projected outwards like a frill, and uses them to close off the earth tube. She still has to close off the entrance, 
so her offspring can grow up well protected and supplied with food. A poppy mason bee can do no more for her young. In German, the colourful field cow wheat is called Wachtelweizen, or quail wheat in English, because of the common quail's liking for its seeds. It's rare, as are a lot of others in this remarkable cornfield. The young hamster pups are very lively. Although they're only one day old, they keep their mother on the go. Again and again, the hamster doe has to round up the little runaways and tidy up the insulating nest. A creeping thistle in the rye is a meeting place for very special field inhabitants. The creeping thistle gallfly needs the prickly plant because only there does it live and multiply. The pretty flies with their zigzag wing designs do mating dances in front of the females and try to impress other males with their threatening gestures. This sometimes leads to actual wrestling. The thistle also serves as a habitat for small spiders, who are particularly fond of hunting for flies. and the hunted face each other. However, contrary to what one would expect, the gallfly doesn't flee. The effect of the zigzag pattern on its wings becomes evident now. The spider thinks they are the legs of an overpowering rival, sees in the courageous gallfly another larger spider and retreats. The four-day-old hamster offspring have already donned a brightly coloured downy hair. Although they're still blind, they're interested in everything their mother brings to them. As early as thousands of years ago, people cultivated many different kinds of grain from wild grasses. An important characteristic of this commercially grown grass is that the ripe seeds do not fall out of the ears by themselves. This means a lot more work for the sparrows and gives the farmer a chance to harvest the crops. This is not the case with the wild plants such as the poppy. The poppy blossoms for just a short time. Only a few days after coming into bloom, it loses its beauty. As the fruit capsules ripen and dry up, they open at the top like small pepper shakers. The flower stems that were pliable before have now become hard and wiry, 
With every gust of wind, hundreds of poppy seeds fall out of a shaker onto the ground. They roll into every crack and wait there for good germination conditions in the following year. The colourful splendour of the blossoms in the cornfield depends therefore primarily on the selection of seeds which have survived the winter in the ground. Some come from far away, like the dandelion seeds on their little parachutes. Harvester ants feed on plant seeds which they drag into their nest in strenuous travel up and down hills. Most of the seeds disappear into the ants' stocks as food supply for times of scarcity. Heaps of cornflour, poppy and dandelion seeds. That is one reason why most field flowers produce such enormous quantities of seeds. Although the first grain fields around the old cherry tree are ripe, the hamster's stocks are almost empty. She has to look for other food. In the sea of ears of corn, there is more to be found than just seeds of grain. The bush cricket's green camouflage doesn't help her. In the fields around the hamster's burrow, there is a splendid display of golden ears of corn. The barley ears with their long beards. The rye, which developed from what was originally regarded as field weeds. Upright wheat, our oldest variety of corn. And oats with their bell-shaped fruit. For thousands of years, they have been ensuring the survival of mankind. The summer sun not only ripens the corn, it draws all moisture out of the plants and soil. The cornfield becomes a hot savanna. In former times, the farmers who were working hard under the blazing heat of the sun believed the quails were mocking them because it sounded as if they were saying, bend your back, bend your back. The yellow hammer, on the other hand, blares out the less severe little bit of bread and no cheese into the field. Around the old cherry tree there are still hedges and groves where the colourful sparrows rear their young. Suddenly, the field orchestra falls silent. The petals on the pimpernel close as a sign that rain is on its way. The corn lady is moving through the field, was said once whenever the wind passed over the corn. The smallest in the jungle of storks are now faced with a fight against elemental forces.
pouring rain has driven the brooding quail hen from her nest. Without protection, her second clutch of eggs is exposed to wetness and cold. And how are the little hamster pups faring in their underground realm? The streams of water are already merging at the deepest points. However, down here, it's perfectly dry. The hamster mother instinctively dug the entrances to her burrow at a higher spot to prevent water penetrating the inside of the burrow even in heavy rainfall. The young hamster pups, hardly four weeks old, engage in boisterous tussles as training for future conflicts with members of their own species. The mother teaches the small ones everything they need to know about what hamsters eat. Hamsters are very clean. To relieve themselves, the little hamsters use the same chosen toilet location each time. The growing hamsters actually spend most of their time sleeping and most likely dreaming. In the late afternoon, the rain is over and the storm front has moved on. A wonderful smell of damp earth and warm straw fills the air. The water has collected in hollows and depressions in the ground. It's time for some cornfield inhabitants to prove their seaworthiness. Those who live at the top of the corn jungle have nothing to fear. For the jumping spider, the field is dotted with sparkling drinking ponds. The harvester ants, on the other hand, have become flood victims. A poppy petal serves them as a rescue raft. Clinging to corn stalks, they make their way to safety. At a dizzy height, the harvester ant queen holds out until the deluge eventually subsides. The water-drenched soil forces the earthworms up to the surface. That is a call to action for all creatures who are partial to these ringed soil dwellers. A field like this accommodates an average of 500 earthworms in each square meter of soil. 10 to 20 times as many as in a conventionally farmed field. A lot of worms will attract a lot of toads, which along with the worms will exterminate scores of pests.
Up to 100 tons of excrement are produced by two and a half million earthworms per hectare. A lot of humus and free of charge, but only as long as no agrarian chemicals are used. Against such quantities, the number of worms eaten by the common toads and golden ground beetles is insignificant. The hamster's pups are already quite independent. They won't share the burrow with their mother and sisters for much longer. However, they still forage for food together in the corn jungle. For four weeks now, the mother has been devoted to her young, bringing them the poppy blossoms they desire. But she soon will become a loner again and leave the burrow and her offspring. Secure in the dense thicket at the edge of the field, the small yellow hammers have grown up. Only two weeks old, they're just about ready to fly away. Well hidden in a sea of stalks, the harrier fledglings are growing up. On rich lime loamy soil warmed by the summer sun, the now very rare field nigella thrives. Its flower is male at first and much sought after by the hungry field wasps. Once they reach it, the wasps move around the entire flower, which is therefore referred to as a roundabout flower. The insect gradually opens the well-filled nectar pots at the base of the petals. Meanwhile, the plant's stamens powder the back of the wasp with pollen. A sex change occurs then. The male anthers droop and cease functioning. At the same time, the female stigmas bend downwards. Again, the field wasps are attracted by their nectar pots that are still full. The wasps which first visited the male stamens, now graze their pollen-powdered backs along the stigmas. This reliably ensures the fertilization and reproduction of the field nigella. With the onset of twilight, the campions open their white blossoms. They first exude their sweet scent when most of the other field flowers have already withered. Campions reflect the moonlight and serve as shining signals for moths. The special composition of their pollen nectar attracts owlet moths and hawk moths in particular. In return for their nocturnal pollination, they too are rewarded with sweet energy food. A common toad sets off to catch prey. It's better protected against predators in the dark, just like the young field hamsters are. Increasingly, their mother maintains a distance from them and hardly ever comes back to the burrow. What turns this special field into a habitat for the most varied animals and plants is sustainable farming, without any toxins. Modern industrial agriculture, on the other hand, 
has not only sacrificed biodiversity to profit, but also clean groundwater and healthy soil. Harvest time for the animals first. More and more ripe corn ends up in hungry stomachs. At the same time, the corn collectors have to be careful not to get eaten themselves. A single tree sparrow can eat a kilogram of grain seeds per year. However, as he eats even more weed seeds and pest insects, he makes himself quite useful. And the field hamster, once regarded as a serial pest and rigorously hunted, has been fighting for survival for a long time, and nowhere does it make its negative impact on yields more noticeable. The tranquil life for animals in the fields by the old cherry tree is now over. The cornfield has become a battleground. There's only one way out. Slashing and clearing paradise. Noisy monsters put an end to the summer jungle. What is left of bare stubble fields. The calls of the quails and the chirping of the bush crickets have fallen silent. There are only a few poppies left at the edge of the field. As suddenly as they came in the spring, the animals wander off again. The quails and Montague's harriers migrate south. While the common toads start off on an arduous march towards their winter quarters. The hamster doe is one of the few left. She's looked for a new burrow and now must do something crucial for her survival. The toad has reached its destination. It will bury itself under the large field hedge and wait for the next spring. Rooks search the harvested field for grains and insects. The hamster doe, too, looks out for pickings, whereby some hairs stick in her throat. Into her cheek pouches, she stuffs the grains that have fallen down during the threshing. A hamster must collect and carry about four kilograms of plant seeds so that it can survive the long winter. In the hamster burrow, 
there's always a storage chamber, and she fills it now in the late summer. The grain field has fed and satisfied a lot of animals, but now the corn must be used for its actual purpose, to be made into food for people. The corn jungle has disappeared and its inhabitants have scattered to the four winds. However, preparations are already underway for next year's cycle. Autumn, the black thorns on the field box are bearing fruit. Soon, the first white flakes will fall on the old cherry tree at the edge of this very special organic field. Between the fields around the old cherry tree, there are still dense hedges offering shelter for the field inhabitants. The golden ground beetles have entrenched themselves in the soil, just as the common toad has done. The harvester ants, too, will spend the winter at the foot of a slow bush. The hamster doe has completed her new burrow in good time, and her sleeping phases are longer and longer her body temperature begins to drop. The hares and roe deer, on the other hand, stay awake and have to struggle to get by during the winter. Mr. Doe wakes up again and again to help herself from her supplies. She won't see daylight again for another six months. Winter. The seeds of the poppy flowers and the other wild field plants lie dormant in the soil. Nevertheless, some animals still manage to find enough to eat in the field. Next year, when a new summer jungle emerges, innumerable field inhabitants will benefit from the ecological tillage. That is Poppy's promise. <laughs>